Oh boy, where do we even start with this one? As someone who's probably the most highly requested artist at the moment, I assume little introduction is needed. Leaf is someone that has taken the rhythm game world by storm over the past several years of her music, and even though she's definitely one of the newer artists, she's established herself as one of the greatest composers to have ever graced both BMS and the rhythm game scene. It's got to a point where it'd be rare to find a rhythm gamer that hasn't heard of her name at least once. So where'd it all begin for her? Welcome to another history of rhythm game artists. It's believed the first time Leaf was seen was in 2011, in a rather obscure BMS contest. In the summer of that year, the 8th installment of what Roshi Chazé to the Unknown Exhibition was being held. This was a contest that allowed for newer and more inexperienced BMS artists to show what they're capable of, as well as compete against each other, hence the name. This mainly came about because of how difficult it was for new BMS composers to get any significant attention and stand out, especially in larger contests such as the BMS of Fighters, which you'll be seeing a lot of in this video. In this contest, Leaf Submitted was the earliest known composition a progressive rock track that went by a spiral history. For all intents and purposes, this was the beginning of a legend. Now the sound of this is actually unexpectedly good. You can sort of hear the early version of Leaf's chaotic composing style in the melody, and even more so in the progression of the track, like of this part. Granted this was a little too unrefined, and this did receive criticism in the impressions, but other than that it was pretty well received, which for any artist's first composition is quite rare. <laughs> or, well, at least it's thought to be Leaf's first composition. Some of you may be wondering, with how good that sounds, surely Leaf has to have done something before this. Well apart from knowing she was born on June 18th, 1994, there is absolutely no record of anything she has done, or is said to have done, before 2011 at least according to my findings. She is perhaps the most mysterious rhythm game artist when it comes to her childhood and past before BMS, and believe me, I tried my best to find anything I could about it to no avail. What we can be sure of though is that she began her BMS journey with an incredible amount of potential at only 17 years of age, with even the likes of ETIA turning their head and encouraging her to continue her work. Leaf then took a break for a month or so, perhaps improving on her craft or catching up with schoolwork, but little did we know she had the intention of signing up to the biggest BMS event of all time, the BMS of Fighters. Now I think it's unheard of for an artist this new to already begin having a crack at the BMS of Fighters, but Leaf did it anyways, signing up on a team of two others, Uta, who's also a composer that participated in the 8th Unknown exhibition and Yuyo Kitten, who's in charge of illustrations. Together, this was Team Free Fall Syndrome. Now the BMS of Fighters is already incredibly competitive, but like I said earlier, if you don't already have some sort of following beforehand, that difficulty is multiplied by tenfold, and the chances of your work even being considered can be very very slim. The odds were undeniably stacked against these two essentially no-name artists seeing any sort of success in the main event. In order to combat this a little, and gain some experience right before it started, they decided to participate in the preliminary skirmish. This is exactly what it sounds like, a small BMS contest held right before the venue for the main event opens up, where your team must submit exactly one song to compete against any other team that chooses to participate. Any number of artists can work on a song that's been submitted, obviously as long as they're on your team. Hence, Leaf took it on herself to create a song for the skirmish, creating a peaceful, goofy sounding song called Sunny Side Up. Again, even though the melody is a happy-go-lucky one, it still feels all over the place, and it honestly sounds like something Leaf improvised while she was bored in school. Oh, well go figure. According to the README, she produced it in only 3 hours during her English class, using only preset sounds. Generally, the song wasn't that remarkable for me, but then I heard this part. This kinda caught me off guard, and even though it was just going up and down the piano scale, it's still impressive that she came up with this, and managed to make a fit of the song in what was probably less than an hour. If anything, that gave a little hint of what was to come for Leaf. It still didn't change my opinion of the song though, and the song itself only got two impressions, albeit there are ones that praise the song and Leaf's improvement. Plus, impressions are far and few between songs in the preliminaries, with the most of the song game being 8 this time around, so 2 was definitely not bad. Now the team was a little more prepared for the main event, which would begin about a month later in September. You know the drill. As a team, make three of the best songs you can. It can be of any genre, but it must be an original work. For this, Leaf submitted two songs of her own, and Uta submitted one, which was called Lightning, a pretty decent sounding hardcore track. <music> this 
This could actually be an incredibly legit track if the sound was improved, since the mixing in general sounds pretty poor, and it's probably the main shortcoming. That did cause the impressions of this to suffer quite a bit, but luckily, Leaf's two songs came to pick up the slack. First, we have Violence Trident. This is a pretty wild progression from Sunny Side Up and Spiral History. The melody feels far more refined, the sound is at a completely different level, and there's generally a completely different atmosphere to those two. Not to mention Leaf's almost distinctive synth sound is first heard here. Just like Uta's track though, it feels like the mix in here could be worked on. Some parts are way too loud, like that bass guitar in the background, and the percussion barely stands out at all. Not bad regardless, it gained 23 impressions total, at an average of 703 points. This next one though, took Leaf to a whole new level in my eyes. Dub is a sacred art song. This was simply called Parasleet. This is heads and shoulders above Leaf's previous work in terms of complexity. I believe this is around the time artscore was starting to become pretty commonplace, and the standard was starting to be raised quite high for it. So this was seen as mediocre at the time, compared to the likes of people like Sakujo and Sai. But the chaotic piano rush, the momentum of the drum breaks, and the various new sounds introduced is surprisingly well put together. The synth melody around here does sound a little bit awkward though. Probably could have been mixed better as well, and both of these came with consequences. It was still the ace song of the team though, rightfully so, and it's an amazing introduction to the drum and bass and or breakcore side of Leaf. And so, by the end of the contest, with all their points combined, they placed 113th out of 129 teams in the event. Obviously, not remarkable, but it was a start. A couple months later, in December, Leaf joined Ultra Extreme Beat, the sequel event to Extreme Beat. Ultra Extreme Beat worked the exact same way as its predecessor. Your overall score in the competition is determined by not only the impressions you get, but also the BPM of your song. There's a full formula on it here, but it all boils down to create the fastest song you can that sounds good. Generally speaking, the most common genre for this realm of composition is speedcore. It's the most comfortable style to go for, for a fast song after all. But Leaf, surprisingly, went for something different. Much like her first song, Leaf went for a progressive track, and supposedly, this was clocked at 333.3 BPM. Interesting. Let's have a listen. It's interesting to me that Leaf would have rather used the piano as a lead, rather than that electric guitar in the background. I feel like the guitar would have made this so much more powerful, but this is still a decent listen. Not too sure about 333 BPM though. It feels like a single musical bar from this is way too long to be called 333 BPM, and there's generally just no feeling of that kind of speed from this. What I mean by that is, with songs this fast, you can feel the pace of the song pretty easily, but this just feels pretty normal. To me, this is better off at half of that. And something interesting is that the exact same debate happened to Psy in Extreme Beat. A bit of a weird coincidence since they both end up being top BMS producers. Oh, so I can tell Leaf really tried with the mixing, but now it feels like the drums are way too quiet. I can literally only hear the hi-hats, and even then it feels like it's way too quiet. It seems like most people weren't too pleased by these criticisms, and by the end, there were more no's than yeses, and that ended up dropping Leaf's overall score into the ES region, which I'm pretty sure is equivalent to an undefined score, but it was never explicitly defined in the rules. Shortly after this, Leaf uploaded her first song onto her brand new SoundCloud, another progressive track sounding very similar to Eternal Liberty, called Mere Fancy. It's been a tough year for Leaf. Everything she took part in so far has resulted in pretty low tier rankings, but fortunately, she's been getting her name out there, and next year, she would really start to set things in motion for her eventual glow up. 2012 started off with Leaf participating in a rather unique idea for an event. This time, you would submit a song as normal, but not just any song. See, before the event starts, a pool of genre names are collected and reviews to match the number of people registered for the event, so that when an artist registers, they're randomly given a genre that they must work with, and they can only submit a song that's within the boundaries of that. This was called the genre shuffle. The thing I really like about this is that artists could be pushed outside of their comfort zone. There's a lot of one-trick ponies out there in the BMS world, for better or for worse, so this forces artists to experiment and perhaps even find a completely new style, but the biggest downside is that the genre you get could be far harder to make a good impression of than some of the other genres. As an example, look no further than these two songs, Chilly Sharp by NMK and Pandemonium by Psy. Chilly Sharp has a genre of Eurobeat, a very accessible, amazing sounding genre with a lot of potential to make interesting tracks to win impressions with. But on the other hand, Pandemonium has a genre of atonal, which is by far the hardest genre you can make anything that sounds good out of, given the entire gimmick of this genre is to write music that's not bound by a specific key or tone.
take some liberties on this, with Sai using polytonality instead of atonality to create what's an amazing track that surprisingly not many people know about. But the point stands, you could get completely shafted by the genre you're given. So what did Leaf get? Did she get lucky and get a genre she's comfortable with, like progressive rock or hardcore? Or did RNG fail her and give her a genre that we've never even seen her consider? Well. She got a ragged call. Probably not something she's used to, but luckily, a genre that she can make work, given her previous experience in hardcore and breakcore and the like. For her song to qualify as a ragged call, she pretty much had to make normal ragga, a style of DJ infusing Jamaican lyrics and a backing track, but instead make that backing track breakcore. And with that, she created Guilt Feeling. <laughs> The best thing about this is just how well the voice sample and the backing track suit each other. The harmony they create is unexpectedly satisfying to listen to. And the break core and record scratching just makes it 10 times better. There was also this part. Where it feels like the voice itself was used as a break core sample, which is pretty creative coming from Leaf. Personally, this isn't my cup of tea, but surprisingly enough, this was enough for Leaf to get more attention than she ever has before, getting 37 impressions and placing 21st out of the 63 songs in the event. Now things are starting to look up slightly, but can she keep the momentum going? Absolutely. Not even two weeks later, a Toho BMS event was announced, where the goal is to create remixes of the Toho soundtrack. Strictly Toho pieces could be remixed, and any original works were forbidden. This was actually the fourth edition of this event, which roughly translates to Toho Sound Game, and of course, Leaf participated, dropping what's probably one of my favourites from her to date. I believe this is the first song I ever heard from Leaf as well. This was Resurrection Spell, a Reach for the Moon, Immortal Smoke remix. This is probably the beginning of when Leaf begins to find her infamous hardcore style, but it's not quite there yet. A little more on that in a bit, but generally speaking this sounds of much higher quality compared to anything else we've heard from her. And needless to say, pretty much any speed genre combined with a melody from Sun is bound to sound good. Also the switch up from this to this. It is so well done, and everything leading on from that is golden. There's not a huge amount to say about this track, but I genuinely do think Leaf outdid herself here, and from here on is when she really begins to shine. Super underrated, and I definitely prefer this over the original. Sorry son. Her quest would continue to the non-genre contest held in June of 2012. To be honest with you, it's pretty unclear what exactly the gimmick of this contest is. It's never explained what non-genre actually means, but if I were to guess, I'd say producing in a genre that doesn't exist. This didn't seem right though, since I saw some pretty common genres in the songs list. So for now, let's just assume it's your standard individual BMS contest. Although this is probably one of the less significant events in BMS, it's certainly one of the most important ones in Leaf's career. See, for this event, Leaf produced two songs. One of these was Wonderful Dancing, the surprisingly well put together trance song. What was weird about this submission was the inclusion of an alias called Hide Sasaki, and this is mentioned again in the description, but slightly altered, reading Aya Sasaki. Not sure what this is about, but I didn't want to dig too far into it. Regardless, Wonderful Dancing, despite doing very well in the competition, didn't stick the landing as much as the second song did. Don't Think, Feel is dubbed as a melodic techno track, and even though it got less overall points than the previous song, there was one thing that immediately became clear when I started listening. That's right, this is the first time Leaf produced a song in a very distinctive hardcore style that she would use for years to come. Although this is one of Leaf's lesser known tracks, it sounds so similar to some of her later works that it genuinely shocked me when I first heard it, especially when it coming from Wonderful Dancing. Anyone that listens to Leaf regularly should know what I mean, but if you're confused, don't worry, you'd be seeing this style a lot, and everything down to the kick should be recognisable. In fact, in the event she participated in straight after this, where she returned to the unknown exhibition for his ninth edition, Leaf produced a song that in my eyes is nearly identical to Don't Think, Feel, and that was I. But there was a slight difference over it. Leaf had some very chaotic compositions from the start, and now she began to transfer that chaotic energy from her melodies to her timings.
I don't think I need to explain just how ridiculous this is. And as much as I'd like to show you guys the time signatures for these, I honestly don't know where I'd start. It wasn't just time signature changes that gave this song a distinct feel to it either. There were seemingly random lead changes, and to put the cherry on top, there are multiple BPM changes throughout. This style of music proved to serve as a ruthless catalyst for an incredibly difficult and gimmicky BMS file, and this was met with criticism for the unnecessary difficulty. In fact, it seemed among the impressions this track was either a huge hit or a huge miss. Among them all though, one thing was for sure, this was a sound that hadn't been seen before, and if Leaf wanted to take this further, she would have no choice but to further refine her craft. Oh, and it's worth mentioning, this was the first time Leaf's work was animated by the well-renowned Opti Animations, and almost all the BMS mentioned from here on out has an animation tied with it by Opti. To end the year, Leaf returned to the BMS of Fighters for round 2, joining a team with Kurobuku-chan, Pi Divide by 3, Opti and Neko Taro to form To Be Continued. This time the preliminaries were skipped and they went straight for the main event. And to start, Kurobuku chan released a drum and bass song called The 84th Flight. It's always surprising to me to hear the quality of some of the lesser known artists such as this, because this is honestly pretty decent. Granted, the mixing could be better, but it still shocked me, even more so when Wobbles started being added in use. I say this deserves some more recognition, and annoyingly so does the next song by Pi Divide by Free, Distorted Moonlight. This sort of proves my point earlier about the difficulty of not having a following, because this is honestly really cool, perhaps a little directionless, and the uh, genre add even more so to that feeling. I get that's supposed to be a fuse of all these, but it's a bit much. But hey, it's still a really enjoyable listen, especially for their first BMS. Damn. The animation by Opti kind of reminds me of some of those insane, extreme, super demon boss fights from Geometry Dash. Now that I mention it, this is actually the perfect fit for a game like that. You know what time it is now though. It's time to see Leaf's piece, a classic one that some of you may recognize. Presenting Mephisto. So, this song is pretty much exactly like the previous two songs, but without the weird timings of I and the sheer speed of Resurrection spell. The thing that stands out the most about this though, is the shredding of that synth. This is definitely the most complex leaf melody we've heard so far, and the key to understanding why is by the genre name, Wall Temperate Core. What on earth does that mean? Well, this is actually a reference to the well-tempered claviers, two books of preludes and fugues in all 24 major and minor keys for the keyboard, all of which were created by Bach. And since Bach was German, the original title for the books were Das Wohl Temperate Klavier, see the origin? In fact, Mephisto's melody actually comes directly from one of the pieces in the second book, the prelude and fugue in C minor. Bach work for number 847 sounds pretty familiar. Have a listen. Are you having difficulty hearing the resemblance? Here, let me speed it up for you. In the readme, it said that Leaf chose this because it sounds a lot like a boss song in a game, which makes even more sense considering the title and description both reference a devil called Mephisto Feles, a chief demon in the false legend. You can tell I love songs with little details like this. Anyways, Leaf did an amazing job translating classical to a more electronic and modern style. Everything was mixed beautifully, and that translated into some brilliant impressions. By the end, this ended up being the A song for the team, and the team itself ended up getting 37th out of 143 teams that participated. That is an insanely good performance compared to last year. Not bad at all. And you can tell now that Leaf was really starting to hit the ground running. And next year is when Leaf really put her foot on the gas. In early 2013, Leaf submitted a song to an unknown BMS review website. This was called Beto, and it was intended as a convenient way to submit BMS without the stress of competition, but with the ability to get impressions and show off your work. Now, Leaf actually has uploaded prior to what I'm about to show you. Last year in January, she uploaded Second Wind, a hands up song that sounds pretty similar to Wonderful Dancing, just without the vocals. But when Leaf uploaded this time, she actually set a challenge for herself. Her plan was to first compose a song outside of BMS, upload it onto her SoundCloud, then convert it to a BMS, create a score, and create background art as fast as she can in a single sitting. In other words, she was speedrunning BMS charts. In total, everything took 12 hours to create, which is actually pretty impressive. I can't imagine doing all that work in one go. We're only concerned about the song though, of course, which in total took 5 hours to create, and the resultant song was Shichibu Choko.
Considering this is only made in 5 hours, I was expecting this to be pretty rough around the edges and unrefined, but it actually wasn't that bad, especially when compared to something like Sunny Side Up, which was in a similar situation. And sure, Sunny Side Up was made in 2 hours less, but if this doesn't show you how much Leaf has improved in just under 2 years, then I don't know what will. Speaking of which, this song does remind me a lot of Sunnyside, mainly because of how happy it sounds. It is weird though, the title translated is Disappointed Choco. I can't help but feel like there's some underlying negative emotion in the song, like with this part. Don't ask me why, but this part just feels passive aggressive with how much stronger the synth gets. Maybe I'm looking too deep into it, but regardless this is still a pretty decent song. Afterwards, let's just say a breakthrough happened. So far it's been unheard of for Leaf to have had songs featuring rhythm games outside of Japan, but this changed in May of 2013, when the charts of Mephisto was officially added onto the Flash based 4 key rhythm game, Flash Flash Revolution. The special thing about this is that in order to add a chart onto the game, you have to obtain written permission from the artist you want to add music from, which means that you can say with confidence that people outside of Japan and BMS had listened to her music, and her work has slowly been spreading. This is also incredibly important, because this then exposed Leaf to even more people internationally. And since FFR had such strong ties to other rhythm games like Step Mania, this was a gateway to having their songs feature in more rhythm games internationally. It all started with the freeware rhythm games though, particularly Osu after a while, the next big thing. The momentum then carries on with Leaf signing up for the sequel of the non-genre contest, Unlimited Fighters. Everything remained the same as last time, but this time, Leaf wasn't alone. She was joined by Sack, another fellow BMS composer, and together they created the duo Folia Citate, and Folia Citate was responsible for creating a fairly infamous song, at least in the realm of Forky, Heterochromia Eridus. This is the first proper Brico track we've heard from Leaf so far, and man, it does not disappoint. It's unknown who exactly did what, and unfortunately there's no access to a readme, but the combined efforts created a ridiculously fast and hard hitting track. The genres used in this are ASMR level, with how satisfying they are, and throughout the song is used for the perfect combination of slow breakbeats and incredibly fast buzz and snare rolls. The melody reminds me a lot of the kind you'd find in an anime opening, a motivating, epic sounding progression that matches the energy of the drum breaks very well, especially as you get to the ending. Needless to say, this would make for an incredibly difficult difficult charts when it came to rhythm games, and an example of this is proven when it was added to Flash Dash Revolution in December of 2013. At the time, Flash Dash Revolution had a difficulty scale of 1 to 99, with 99 being the hardest, and Heterochromia Iridus landed at 95. To this day, out of the 4,000 players that managed to record a score, only 73 of those managed to get a full combo, and 14 of those have managed to get a triple A. Not at the level of Death Piano or anything, but it's definitely a testament to its difficulty, and this was the beginning of what gave the song a reputation in full key, as it began to also get charted in other rhythm games. Some Somehow this didn't get a remarkable impression in the contest, only getting 27th place out of the 53 songs registered. What a shame, because I do think this is one of Leaf's underrated songs. Or maybe I'm just biased, since this is one of the first tracks I heard in my rhythm game career. Oh well. Speaking of which, yet another breakthrough happened on Leaf's part. A few weeks after the registration of Heterochromia Iridus, the second installment of Sound Voltex, Infinite Infection, was released. Originally, when the game released, there was only 13 songs, but across a year or so, more new songs were added to the game in updates, with new songs usually being picked by contests. These contests allowed artists to create a song based on a set of rules, then get judged, and if the song is deemed good enough, it gets licensed by Konami themselves to be put in the game. This contest in particular was the Sound Voltex production blah 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 remix contest Contest, where you had to remix a single song that had already been licensed by Konami. And here, Leaf decided to set her eyes on Ongaku, a notorious song from Poppin 17 that many consider to be one of the hardest songs from Poppin of all time, even though it's a fairly calm but symphonic classical piece. The main reason for this is because of the incredibly difficult to perform hand movements, and the share speed demanded for those same movements. The song actually peaks in BPM around the end, which is clocked at around 360 according to the EX difficulty, and this sequence right here is the part that kills many, many full combo runs. But I digress. Leaf took the original song, which according to Leaf represented the birth of sound, and created the ruin of sound, expressed by Breakcore. The Kai on Goku mix was created. To 
be honest, this sound is so ridiculous that the exhaust level for this looks severely nerfed compared to what I'm hearing. I'd say Leaf did a pretty good job considering the entire gimmick was to create a song that's as chaotic as possible, but the chart itself doesn't seem to have left much of an impact, if any at all. I could barely find any gameplay or posts around the internet on this file, which is a shame because although it's not memorable, it definitely could have served as a catalyst for an impossible chart. Konami really missed an opportunity here to create a much more difficult and infamous exhaust, but nonetheless, it's an incredible achievement by Leaf to feature in a game like this. She was really starting to become a unique artist, and the BMS of Fighters of this year proved that beyond any doubt. Once again, Leaf returned for the contest which named itself Concert Soul, referenced in a concert hall. The whole idea is that each team is considered an orchestra, and each orchestra will play three songs, with the audience being asked to write their impressions and evaluations at hand in the audience seat. Pretty neat piece of fiction right there, to spice things up. Leaf was joined again by Kurubuku-chan, and Anubasu, KKKFFF2, and 27 also joined to create the team come to an end. To start, Kuroboku-chan released a beautiful, much more chilled out track called Albino. This is one of those songs that's easy to get immersed in because of the atmospheric noises included, and while some may consider it unremarkable, I think it was a pretty nice change in direction from the usual intense electronic music that I hear. Again, pretty underrated. Next, we had Anubasu's Mercury Prayer, a melodic UK hardcore track that is once again severely underrated. <laughs> Not a lot to say about this, but this was Anubis's first BMS, and it's super high quality for that. Really enjoyed it. Let's cut to the chase though. Perhaps the song that was Leaf's breakthrough, since it brought so much immediate attention to her. This was Doppelganger. Whenever I think of Doppelganger, I think of two things. The disorder of the song, as well as the order of the song. Uh, you just contradicted yourself. I hear you saying. If the song has disorder, then how can there be order? Let me explain. It goes without saying the song is, again, super chaotic. There are all kinds of stops, syncopation changes, lead changes, and the break core in the background goes without mentioning. This all rolls together to get one giant confusing mess of an instrumental. When you first listen or play this song, it's pretty easy to get overwhelmed by the amount of things being thrown at you and the seemingly unusual timings. I was the same way after all, but there is certainly some order. To start with, the melody is probably the simplest one we've heard from Leaf yet, and it has two big characteristics that we had yet to see from her. For one, it's catchy. Not a single song prior to this had that feeling, because of how progressive her melodies usually were, which leads to the second characteristic. This melody repeats throughout the entire song, with hardly any development. The only times where you don't hear it is when the song is going into ultra break be a dude's ass mode. Going back to the original point, secondly, the timing is actually on a pretty standard 4-4 signature. The reason I say this is because I thought this is on some wild, chaotic time signature when I first heard it, but it just seems to be very different because of how much is going on. It maintains that until we reach this bit of downtime. And then it shifts back to a standard time signature again. To sum up, this feels like the combination of everything Leaf has done so far. To me, it feels like this is where she really found her style. And she did a great job in showing that in chaos, there is order. Not too sure what this has to do with doppelgangers, and there's no readme available to see what Leaf's true thoughts were on the song because it released. But nonetheless, this was what she'd been waiting for, because as the 8th song of the team, it ended up with 141,000 points, and nearly 90,000 difference from the other two songs. This translated to 4th place out of all the songs in the contest, and it carried her team through to 4th overall. It's safe to say that doppelganger is an icon of Leaf's career, since this was what propelled her to a legendary status in the BMS scene, and hence in the rhythm game scene, and she would use this as a leverage to to continue her growth over the next few years. For the next three years, Leaf wrote off the way she created for herself, creating songs that are all mixtures of the style she's already established for herself. In order to save time, I'm not going to talk about all of these, but this included 8 songs total, including Wistomiat, Alice in Misanthropy, Lyrith, and perhaps the two most infamous songs on Leaf's discography, Aleph Null and Mope Mope. These two songs were ones that took the BMS world, and Rhythm Game world in fact, by storm because of how unique their concepts were. Let's start with Aleph Null, the 8th song of Leaf's one-man team from the BMS of Fighters Ultimate in 2016. That's right. In 2016, Leaf pretty much solo the BMS of Fighters and won by an overwhelming lead of over 200,000 points. The three songs she submitted each garnered over 100,000 points, but out of nowhere was by far the most popular one, gaining just over 370,000 points total. I'm sure you've already heard of out of Null if you're watching this, but in case you haven't, here's what it sounds like. To 
to me, this is a song that's all about instability. It's pretty difficult to predict what's gonna happen next, even after a couple of lessons. And it reminds me a lot of Ai's ending part, without the weird time changes. It's all the more clear why this is, when you see what Leaf was intending to go for here. She was trying to represent music in a world without sound. Obviously that in itself is a confusing thought. Besides, how can it possibly be music when sound doesn't exist? But I guess it's just a hypothetical, you know if somehow music were to transcend above the realm of sound. The very thought of that being the case is actually pretty overwhelming to comprehend, and it's pretty similar to the theme that's present in both the title and throughout Opti's animation, the concept of infinity. If you study math beyond, say, high school, you should know that infinity is not a number, but it's actually the concept of an endless quantity. It's a concept that can be understood by humans, but a concept that can't be comprehended by humans. Similar to how music in a world without sound can't be comprehended, and it's a common rumour to hear that trying to imagine infinity can drive a human insane. I'm not sure how true that rumour is, but I do think that was what this song was trying to target. The instability and eventual insanity that spawns as you try and venture with your imagination further and further into the unknown. Then we have Mope Mope, a song from the BMS of Fighters 2017 that ended up taking third place overall. Uh, this just sounds like a nursery rhyme. How on earth did this take third place? Well, this song was all about glitchiness which Leaf describes as bugs in the readme. Apparently, the inspiration for the song was actually from a whole genre called E-Room. The only way you can get this sort of stuff is by looking up the kanji, seemingly because of how it's translated, but it's a genre of music that focuses entirely on the whole glitchy, buggy aspect of music. In case you haven't guessed, the gimmick is that this song glitches from a cute, fun, colourful vibe to a I'm inside your house. Don't look behind you. Type beat. Whenever it does glitch, much heavier sounding instrumentals are used, break is introduced, and the lead melody is changed to sound sharper and more menacing. The meaning of this is best explained by Leaf herself. She says, quote, The first half of the song is about playing with blocks in the kindergarten, and the second half is about kicking a tower blocks to the ground. Yeah, that sounds pretty accurate to me. Oh, and to end the readme, she finishes with a classic call for help. What a wonderfully lighthearted experience this song is. But hey, it's always pretty interesting to see the sort of horror take its place in the BMS world, it just makes things that much more entertaining. With all of this, Leaf's music began to get featured in more and more rhythm games, and before anyone knew it, she became a household name when it came to rhythm game music. Anyways, I think I'm gonna end here. Anyways, I think I'm gonna end here. Anyways, I- We didn't think I was gonna skip over this, did you? We're not that short on time this time around, so I wanna talk about one of my favorite BMS works as of recent. The year is now 2018. Leaf has just released her first actual album called Doppelganger, which is essentially a collection of remasters and extensions of her previous work. And the Go Back to Your Roots 2018 has just been announced, which is pretty much the BMS of Fighters, but it shares some of the rules from the older editions of BMS of Fighters, hence the name. There was a lot of hype this time around, because what's probably the greatest team in BMS history had just been formed. The powerhouse team called Herbicide, consistent of Psy, Sakuji, Joe, Leaf, among Nikki Simmons for her vocals, and six others for their background art and video. Unsurprisingly, this was the most popular team of the contest. This team was actually formed under the theme of Herbicide, more specifically the poisonous, destructive aspect of it, and you notice each song represents this theme in some way. Bad Elixir explores the poisonous, literal aspect of Herbicide, obviously by the name, Destroyer explores the destructive aspect of it, and Marinol explores both. See, the thing that perhaps draws the most attention to Marinol is the background art, brilliantly done by Opti. The background art shows a girl in a dress who seems to be dying repeatedly for no good reason. It seemed like it was just done for a shock value, and this background art was actually met with a huge amount of controversy because of the gore and extremely violent nature met without any pre-warning. Some people gave super low impressions because of this, claiming things like the song was decent but the background art ruined it. Looking past all of this though, Marinol has a pretty fascinating and honestly really sad story behind it, included in a readme of the BMS file. Now it's all in Japanese, but thankfully a full translation was done by none other than Frums and uploaded onto Pastebin, which has also been leaf approved. So the full details of the story can be found here, but it all boils down to this. This girl in the dress is someone who's very interested in her dreams. So much so that she keeps a record of her dreams in her dream journal so she doesn't forget them. Because well, it's just fun for her to do. When she reads back on it, it feels like she's remembering extra memories from her past and it makes her feel more alive. As she laments on how difficult it can be to record all the details before they slip away from your mind, she reveals that lately she's been having a disproportionate number of bad dreams that end in certain death seem familiar. Now, this wouldn't be so bad were enough for the fact that she feels all the pain and suffering associated with each of her deaths as if it were happening for real. And the supposed reason for this? A drug she'd been taking, called Marinol. From here she reveals some background, saying that she's in fact depressed. She took drugs originally that she was transcribed, but it did nothing. She did counselling, 
but did nothing. She soon stopped medicating and eventually lost the will to go outside. Even leaving her room became nothing short of a challenge and she started having physical symptoms too, like collapsing and vomiting, even though there was nothing to vomit since she also stopped eating. Eventually, it got so bad that she started looking for suicide methods. She says without any intention of actually going through with it, but that's unlikely. She found an antidepressant through an automatic advertisement that had powerful antidepressant properties, mood enhancement, and nutritional supplements with a long tail of effectiveness. But the side effect? Dreams so bad they approached death. She still saw this as an opportunity though. Having recovery as a main effect and death as a side effect sounded like a win-win for someone suicidal after all. And well, she just didn't think it would be that bad. Besides, her dream journals made bad dreams kind of fun to have. And it'd be hard to tell if it was the drugs causing it or if it was her anyways, right? So she just took a bunch without paying too much attention to the instructions. She was overconfident. She figured she's OD'd before. So if it happens now, it's no big deal. Needless to say, she was dead wrong. In the last part of the story, she expresses her utter regret in this decision, and she realizes that the warning may have been more severe than she anticipated. Dreams so bad they could approach death may not have been talking about approaching deaths in dreams. They were likely talking about real life, since supposedly people can die because their dreams feel so real that their brain goes into shock. So, she accepts it. If she dies in real life, she concludes no one will be able to tell what killed her, since she would have no injuries. And that's why she's writing all this. But for now, all she can do is continue to die over and over and over and over until it ends one way or another. The story then ends with the girl telling us good night. Well, that is quite the story to take in, and if you haven't guessed what I meant by saying it represents both the poisonous and destructive aspect of herbicide, picture it like this. The drug marinol is the bad elixir, and her psyche is slowly being destroyed by it. It's really sad to think about, you know, and if I'm honest, the vibe I get from the ending is that she does end up dying from shock in the end. Heartbreaking. But when all is said and done, at the very least, we got a good song from it. In order to complement the story, Leaf composed a song with a terrifying, glitchy atmosphere. The screams sound legitimately terrifying, especially when combined with hardcore kicks, and there were things that I didn't expect at all included, like seeing the dubstep elements around this part. I had no idea she was capable of this at all. It just goes to show how much she's progressed over the last several years. Anyways, at first this was looking like it ended up performing poorly for this team standard, but as the competition continued on, more and more people recognised the quality of the entire BMS package and it ended up 5th place out of the 415 songs in the competition. This helped the team have what is probably the single best performance in BMS history, accumulating over 1 million points to finish. What do we expect from the power trio after all? The song itself also sits at 6.3 million views on YouTube, which almost beats Freedom Dive in views. That's an insane accomplishment from Leaf and Opti. And that's about it, I believe. For for real this time, I promise. So far, Leaf has had a lucrative career in the rhythm game scene, and with the BMS of Fighters 2021 around the corner, I'm excited to see what she has in store for that and her future music. She's no doubt one of my favourite rhythm game artists at the moment though, and I hope the video has helped give some insight into her progression and how she got to where she is today. As always, if you enjoyed, leave a like, subscribe, and comment on who you want to see next. If you didn't, then feel free to leave a dislike and tell me what you want to see changed. Also, be sure to support Leaf's music. Links to her platforms are in the description. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in a bit.